Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. Father, asking us that you would protect us from pride and that you would grant us a heart of humility. Father, we just pray that, Father, you would draw us near, that we see your greatness and in comparison we realize how small we are. But in the midst of that, we would realize that we are yours and we are loved unconditionally. Father, that we, would, we would be drawn to humility, Father knowing that is the place that you desire us to be. And so, Father, we just pray today that you'd work with our hearts and work with our minds and help us see and help us hear that we could truly understand what you're calling us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pride is often present in the heart of man. I know it, you know it. It fits really well with the way the world thinks. Be great. Make a name for yourself. Reputation, image, success. But then God's word comes in and calls us to something totally different. In James 4, it says this, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, author W.W. Wearsby tells how the phrase, submit yourselves to God, which is here, was a military phrase. And it meant, get into your proper rank. We might say it today, know your place. When the private acts like the colonel or the captain acts like a general, we have problems. But know your place. We must know our place. In the same way, when we, as children of God, want to be Lord of our own lives or take credit for the things that God has done or think too highly of ourselves, pride has taken root. We have gotten out of our place. Things are not in the proper order We are out of rank, and that should never be said of us or true of us, especially as believers. We must be a people who know our place. It's a very key idea in Scripture, the idea of humility, because you could say that humility is the door. Humility is the soil that all the other graces grow out of. Uh, If you're familiar with the passage that talks about the fruit of the Spirit, mentioning things like love and joy and peace and 
self-control and goodness and gentleness, all of those things grow out of the soil of humility. Because if we lack humility and we walk in pride, the door is closed. The soil stops bearing fruit because we no longer depend on the fruit giver. We no longer bow our hearts. We no longer seek in prayer because we think we don't need to. We have become independent. We can do it ourselves. We can fix the problems ourselves. The humility is the doorway to everything else that God has for us. And when we walk in pride, everything else in our spiritual maturity stops. Humility is key. As we continue in that, in Luke 18, 9 through 14, we see an example. Uh, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. It says this, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. In William Barclay's commentary, he expresses it this way. This is why humility is so important in the life of a Christian. Barclay says this, Only when a man realizes his own ignorance will he ask for God's guidance. Only when a man realizes his own poverty in things that matter will he pray for the riches of God's grace. Only when a man realizes his weakness in necessary things will he come to draw upon God's strength. Only when a man realizes his own sin will he realize his need of a Savior and of God's forgiveness. Humility is the doorway to everything else that God has for us. Now, of course, Jesus is going to be the ultimate example. Jesus... God, Emmanuel, God with us, left his place in heaven to become a man, taking on the form of man, as Philippians 2 talks about. And not just becoming one of us, I mean, that was humbling enough, but even laying down his life on a cross, which in the Old Testament would have been associated with being hung on a tree, which that only happened to all those who were cursed. So Jesus associates himself as one cursed. And scripture goes on to say, For our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is our example. Left everything that he had in heaven, became one of us, even laying down his life. But he was not only humble in his death, he was humble in his life. We read it in the Gospels, throughout the Gospels. In the Gospels, it starts out, he is born in a manger, not a palace. He associates with and blesses children who were not valued in his day. He touched the unclean leper. He spoke to the sinful Samaritan woman. He ate with tax collectors and even chose as his disciples uneducated fishermen. Jesus thought in a way totally different than the world thinks. And he's calling us to do the same. We see humility in the life of Paul. We see in 2 Corinthians how Paul has received so many visions and revelations from God that God allows a thorn in the flesh. Now, it wasn't a literal thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it was. We see clues and hints throughout Scripture. It could have been a sickness. It could have been a chronic pain. It could have been, in some places, it looks like he had problems with his eyes and his vision. We don't know for sure. But we do know that Paul prayed that God would remove it. 
And God said, no. He promised grace that would be sufficient to endure it. Why? I mean, had God not used Paul to do other miracles in other people's lives, why couldn't God just do this simple thing? Because God was protecting Paul from himself. Paul knows, I mean, God knows the nature of man. He knows what you and I are tempted to do, even in the midst of blessing, and sometimes more so in the midst of blessing. Pride begins to take root. And so because of everything that God had done through Paul, Paul, God came in to protect Paul in the way he protected him from pride and kept him walking in humility was the thorn in the flesh. You and I are probably familiar with those at times. Maybe we didn't see it as God keeping us humble and keeping us in the blessable place. Maybe we raised our voice or raised our fist and raged at God when God was just protecting us from ourselves. Why? Because humility is the key, the door, the soil for everything else that God wants to do in our lives. As we continue through that, we look at Paul's life. We see later in Paul's life, even at the peak of Paul's missionary work, because God had kept him walking in humility, Paul was still describing himself as the least of the apostles and the chief of sinners. It would have been so easy for him to brag and to boast, but yet Paul had been kept by God in the place of humility. It's interesting in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul even begins to tell us, reveal to us part of the secret that he's writing to the church in Corinth. He says to them, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Where does our boasting come from? Where does our bragging come from? Where does our pride come from? Have we earned the breath that we just breathed? Do we somehow deserve the heartbeat that just happened in our chest? Do we deserve the family we have or the education we have or the place where we sleep at night? Do we deserve any of the accolades maybe you have or the awards that you've won? We don't deserve anything. We haven't earned anything. Paul is saying, have you not received Everything that you have? Has it not been a gift? Has it not been an expression of grace? Then how can we brag and boast? Because God is the good giver of good gifts. But he's the giver of good gifts. We owe gratitude, indebtedness. But how can we be prideful for the things that God has blessed and God has given. As we continue thinking about this, we we end up arriving, as always, in the gospel. Because in the gospel, several things happen. For you and I to have become believers, if you are a believer today, if you've come to the point where you've turned from your sin and put your trust in Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, does it not demand humility? There's no other way to get there. You can't avoid the doorway of humility and get to Christ. There has to be a point where we confess sin, where we cry out to a Savior, where we admit our need and our insufficiency. That's the only way you get to Christ. And so humility is the way you enter in, but humility is also the way that we continue in it. It's humility. When we lack humility and instead are carried along by pride, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We become self-sufficient and self-righteous and overbearing and easily offended and, and defensive because we no longer stand in identity that we have in Christ, which is secure forever. But instead, we have built this castle or this throne or a crown for ourselves. The only problem is when you and I build our own identity, we are fragile and insecure because everyone is a threat. We have to be prettier. 
And we have to be smarter. And we have to be richer. We have to be funnier. However you sense it, when we walk in our own identity and we build our own house of who we are, we are a very fragile people. And so pride comes in if I can say, look, I am better. Whether you want to claim education, whether you want to claim how many languages you speak, or you want to claim how much you have, whatever it is, the whole world turns into a competition. And so we puff up ourselves when we win, and we feel broken and defeated on the edge of despair when we lose. Our other option is to push all of that aside and step back into the center of the gospel where we have been loved by a holy, immense God. And by that, we are forced to bow our heart because we can't come to him and have any other response. And as we bow our heart and as we are convicted of sin and as we confess and call out to him for help, we are humbled. But then what we receive in return is forgiveness and newness of life. We're a new creature. We're a child of the king. We're a treasure. Our identity has now been granted to us, and you can't take it away from me. And I can't take it away from you. People may sin against us, and it may hurt. We may lose our job. We may not win the award. Tears may come to our eyes, and our hearts may be broken. But there is one level of brokenness that will never happen to us again because we are firmly held in the hands of the Father. And no one can take away our identity, and the competition is no longer necessary. The mask that we wear becomes a relic of the past, because we don't have to impress. We don't have to hide imperfections because we know we are loved. We know how the story ends. We know our identity. We no longer have to be the best. All of that disappears. Can you imagine a life where you get out of bed and walk into the world and you are just free? You're allowed to have hairs out of place or shirts misbuttoned or whatever we do at times to embarrass ourselves, and we're fine. It's okay not to get the promotion. It's okay to make a mistake at work and have to apologize and get better. It's fine. Why? Because we're no longer wrapped up in the man-centered competition for our identity. We are in the gospel. And we are fully known, yet completely loved. And that will never end. That's the gift that we've been given. But it is the core foundational piece of humility. Because if we forget the gospel, if we forget who we are, if we forget who we belong to and who holds us tightly, then once again, even as believers, we were drawn back in to the game of competition. And it was never intended to be that way. If we're children of God, then humility is God's will for our lives. It's always going to be God's will for our lives. He's never going to stop working humility in our lives. And so here's the option. Are we going to work with God in that process, or are we going to work against him? Two examples. John the Baptist. If you look in the Gospels, in the story of John the Baptist, especially in John 3, Jesus had now begun his public ministry, and more people were now going to hear Jesus than hear John. And so some of his followers came to him and said, are you not noticing? Look, the crowds are now going to Jesus. Now, if that's you, the normal you, the you that you're used to being, how are you going to respond to that? Okay, team, well, let's put up more signs. 
and let's send out more emails and let's buy some advertisement on Facebook. How are you going to respond to that? Are you going to go to bed at night and go, oh, man, I knew I should have prepared more. I got to pick a new location. How are you and I going to respond if we were John the Baptist? This is how John responds. Speaking of Jesus, well, it says, when John was asked about this, he told of how his role was to prepare the way for Christ and that his joy was now complete Speaking of Jesus, John said, he must increase and I must decrease. Going back to that phrase in the book of James that we read earlier, he knew his place. He knew his proper rank. He knew his role in the eternal story. And he was fine. Glory to Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Your other option is who we talked about last week, if you were here, King Nebuchadnezzar. How many lessons did he have to endure? Multiple times God worked in his life to show King Nebuchadnezzar who he was. I am the revealer, interpreter of dreams. I am the savior of men. And yet Nebuchadnezzar's heart continued to walk in pride. And so what happens? God takes away his sanity for seven years. And it says this, The king ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers. His nails were like bird's claws. And only then, then did the king humble himself, lift up his eyes to heaven, and bless the Most High who lives forever. Once again, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, you and I must understand that it is a priority for God that we walk in humility. And he is going to do whatever it takes to bring that to pass because Scripture teaches us that we will be made like Christ. And so as you and I look at our lives today, what is God working in your life to bring humility? Maybe it's failing an exam. Maybe it's not getting the job that you applied for. Maybe it's no longer having this much money in the bank like the past and it's now this much money. It could be you're really good at a whole lot of things, but God is allowing parenting to be very complicated for you. There are a thousand ways that God could humble us. It could be on the metro, somebody treats you badly. Do they not know who I am? How can that even come out of our mouth? God will work humility. And so you and I either join with him and walk in that, or we refuse him and choose to walk in pride, just knowing we've just made a choice that may make our life very complicated. Now, as we go on from here, what do we do? I mean, I have moments of pride, you have moments of pride. Pride is going to be a constant temptation until our life is over. So it's there. Don't say it's not. Everybody has their own form of it. Sometimes we even have a form that looks like fake humility, and it's really pride being expressed in a different way. We're all going to struggle with it. So let's walk through a few ideas. First of all, practical ideas. Take the time to evaluate yourself. Why do we do what we do? Why do you say what you say? Why do you present yourself the way that you present yourself? Whose glory are we living for, ours or God's? Whose opinion do we care more about, people's or God's? When you do good deeds, are you seeking the praise of man or seeking them anonymously so that no one knows? Why do we do what we do? That's one question. 
Going on from there, one assignment could be this. When we walk in humility, it releases the pressure to perform, but it drives us to this place. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any, any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, for those who firmly walk in pride, they will discount this as not necessary and they will go on their own way, not even thinking about it. But those who walk in humility will at least be willing to embrace the assignment. That we set ourselves authentically, transparently in front of God and say, God, shine your light into my dark places. Knowing there is very likely that there are areas of pride in our lives that we don't even recognize. But desiring the way of humility, we take a verse like this and lay it before God and say, God, expose me. Reveal me. I would rather walk in humility exposed than walk in pride with a mask. A few other things if we want to walk in humility. Another way to join God in the process of being made humble is intentionally put yourself in positions of humility. Now, this isn't always going to be real popular. Volunteer to serve others. Avoid the spotlight. Do the tasks that no one else wants to do. Work behind the scenes. Avoid bragging or gossip, which are ways of lifting yourself up and pushing others down. Take time alone with God to confess sin. It's an act of humility. Be thankful. Become better at apologizing. Seek God in prayer. Seek his wisdom and Bible reading. All of these are ways to intentionally humble ourselves. It could be today that what we're talking about, there is a red flag happening in your head and your heart, and you know there are areas in your life that you're guilty of pride. And it could be today you do have ears to hear, and you're hearing what God is wanting to say. The only question is, how do we get from here to there? How do we get from pride to humility? But that's what we're talking about right now. First of all, go before God and say, God, expose me, reveal me, show me. And then we just pray it back to God. We confess it back to God. We surrender it to God and let him begin to do the work. The other things are the things that I just said, whether it be in an apology, whether it be gratitude, whether it be an anonymous act of service that nobody on the planet knows about. Your pride hates that. Now, do any of those actions that I just talked about, do any of those have the power to change your heart? No. God is the changer of hearts. But when we begin to habitually live in a way that begins to take the back seat, begins to take the lower position, begins to do the things that nobody else wants to do, begins to do the things that before we would have said, well, that's below me. Is it really below us? Why would it be below us? Why should we not do those things? As we begin to habitually live in that way, you could say it goes from habit to condition of heart, where you just begin to walk in the way of habit. I have a game that at times I've played with my daughter, and we begin to keep score. And the way you get points is by being considerate. So let's say she does something for me, and what does she say? I get a considerate point. Okay, then I'm trying to pay attention. And then maybe after lunch, I take her plate to the table, I mean to the kitchen. And I get a considerate point. Now, do I really want people to learn to be considerate so they can win a considerate point game? No, but what is it doing? It's just trying to move her in a place where she's considerate. And it was good. 
I was considerate. And I like that. I consider it. And what it did for people, just walking in a way where eventually it's no longer about the points, but it becomes a way of life. It's not that much different. God's going to work on our hearts. But can you and I begin with God's help, with God putting humility in us just to say, I'm going to intentionally begin to put myself in, put myself in a place where I walk in humility with my siblings, with my parents, with my coworkers, with the other people on the bus, with whatever it may be, where we just intentionally begin to commit, I'm going to walk in humility. And when at all possible, I'm going to do it anonymously. No glory, no credit. But God, I know that your word teaches me that humility is the key to everything else you have for us. And I want that. We see an example in Luke 14. Jesus told a parable. He said, now he told a parable to those who were invited. And when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, oh, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Intentionally putting ourselves in places of humility. Uh, another point I have to mention, if you and I are going to walk in humility, one of the most dangerous places we can be is social media. Why? Well, you tell me. Why is social media difficult? Because most people always make themselves look good. Look where I traveled. Look who I spent the day with. Look what I just got. Social media is neutral. It can be used for good. But at the same time, it is an ideal place to feed the flesh and the pride. And that could be one of the places you need to go back and evaluate. If you're into social media, can you go back and say, okay, what have I posted in the last week? What have I posted in the last month? Those who are followers of mine or watching what I'm putting out there, are they now pointed closer to Christ because of the humility they sense through the social media or, and that's going to be an exception because most of the time it's the other way, or after watching what I've been posting, are they now pursuing the things of the world more? Are they now pursuing beauty more? Are they now pursuing fame more? We are lights of the world. We're a testimony. We're ambassadors of Christ. But we're also to be people of humility. That is probably one of the places in our world right now that is the most e it is easiest to be drawn astray. May we be a people of humility. We live in the city, and the disadvantage of that is we can't sit out and enjoy the stars. But for those of you who are from the country, or from places that don't have as many lights as Madrid, or have spent time outside of the city, you ever laid down and looked up at the stars, and we're only seeing the beginning. You go solar system, and whether you want to go galaxy and universe and light years, and the conversation begins to get so far and the number is so big that our mind cannot even contain them. But it was created by our God by a spoken word. If he is that big and I belong to him, what should my response be to him? 
If we fix our eyes on God, the natural response will be humility because it can be no other. Can you imagine that person standing in that picture looking at the universe that was created and the God who created it and giving himself glory? That doesn't even make sense. For you and I to be a believer and to walk in pride means that we are truly not walking close to God. Why? Because what happens naturally when we walk close to God? That happens. Let me give you another example that may be a little more personable. From a distance, the Eiffel Tower looks interesting. Huh. Wow, look, it's taller than the other buildings. That's neat, and we just keep on going. It really doesn't affect us deeply. It really doesn't affect us emotionally. But wow, Eiffel Tower is taller than the other buildings. That's interesting. That's the way we look at it when we're from a distance. It's kind of similar to the way we look at God. Amen. I read my Bible this week, said a prayer, went to church. Let's get on with our lives. From a distance, the Eiffel Tower looks interesting. But from up close, it's awe-inspiring. From a distance, I can look at it and forget it. But standing underneath it, I begin to realize how small I am. This sense of awe kind of creeps in. As we talked about in the book of James, things begin to take their rightful place. It works the same way with God. For you and I as believers to walk in pride exposes us for being way out of step. Because it is not possible for a follower of Christ to walk in the presence of God on an ongoing basis and be arrogant and prideful. And I speak that knowing that I am guilty of that and supposing that you likely are too. It is not possible to stand in the presence of an almighty universe-creating God and be arrogant and prideful and sing our own praises. And so if you and I are here today and we're struggling with pride and we long to be more humble, the largest thing we can do is draw near to God. Bible, prayer, confess sin, make things right with your fellow man. And as we draw near to God, what will be the natural result? Humility. I want to close by reading Philippians 2, and you can sit and listen, or you can sit and bow your head and listen. I'm just going to read it. It's not on the screen. I just want you to listen. And we're going to end this way. Philippians 2, 3 through 11 says this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, we come before you today seeing in these verses that there will be a day that everyone bows. But Lord, we come to you today wanting to be a people who bow now. Father, forgive us 
for those moments or even those seasons of pride when we think too highly of ourselves. Father, forgive us when we drift away and our ego increases. Father, forgive us when we step out of rank and forget our place. Father, forgive us. And so, Father, today we ask that you would grant us a humble heart. And Father, not knowing what process that is going to demand, not knowing what you're going to do in our lives to make that possible, but Father, we pray that today that you will give us a heart that will join you in what you're doing in our lives. That we would not kick against the goads, not that we would be angry and fight against the thorns of the flesh, but Father, we would humble ourselves today before you as a potter and the clay and we would let you do as you wish to make us the people of humility that you desire us to be. Father, we thank you for your love that is unconditional, your patience, your mercy. Father, please make it so in us today. In Jesus' name we pray.